Good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. And welcome to the Learning Lab on Disaster Impact Modeling with the seventh regional platform, Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, I think it's a very interesting topic, disaster impact modeling. Um, my name is Brenda Erickson. I work with I'm the Regional Information Management Officer in OCHA for the regional office. And I have over 10 years of experience working with information management. And for me, disaster impact modeling is something that's growing. It's a theme, it's a topic that's making leaps and bounds. Um, it's, being, it's becoming more and more important. I think all the work we do, not only response, but also prevention, mitigation, even development. So we're gonna spend one hour in this learning lab and talking and understanding a little bit more about what is disaster impact modeling, what are the trends, um, how it's being used in the region and also globally, you know, in, in who are the actors that are participating in it, what's the progress, what kind of data are we using and bringing together to be able to do a model and how can that be used. Um, I'm going to present, so as it's a lab, we'll have a little breakout session, but first I'll present the experts. Um, we have three panelists that have a lot of experience in, in information management in general, as well as predictive analysis and modeling. So joining me today is Maria Nella Guzman from Separated Nat. Um, she coordinates private and public alliances in disaster risk management, an architect and international consultant um, working with disaster resilience and multi-sector alliances. We have Leonardo Milano, a predictive and analytical team leader for the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data, also senior data scientist for the Norwegian Refugee Council Internal, Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. And we have John Reynos, who's senior manager, senior information management officer for the UNHCR Global Data Service in Geneva. And um, John also worked in OCHA in Bangkok, the, re the regional office for Asia Pacific, and has done a lot of work as far as modeling and predictive analysis. Before we continue, I'd like to give the um, pass the word on to Marianella for a few opening remarks as well. Thank you very much, Brenda. Um, I'm, and then uh, I'm going to switch to Spanish now. En, en nombre de nuestra secretaria ejecutiva Claudia Herrera Melgar del Centro para la Coordinación para la Prevención de los Desastres en Centroamérica y República Dominicana, quien lamenta enormemente no estar con nosotros en el día de hoy, deseo expresar nuestros agradecimientos a la coordinación y a la invitación del gobierno de Jamaica y así a la Oficina de las Naciones Unidas para la Reducción de Riesgo de Desastres de, las América, de América Latina y del Caribe. De igual forma, queremos agradecer a nuestros colegas de CEDIMA y UN OSHA por el liderazgo y el desarrollo de este laboratorio de aprendizaje sobre la modelación y el impacto de los desastres, donde buscamos ofrecer una experiencia de aprendizaje única e interactiva a los participantes, que permita así mejorar la comprensión del riesgo sistémico de los desastres en la región En esta región, eh, tanto en Centroamérica como en el Caribe y en las Américas que vivimos en, en múltiples amenazas, así como la importancia del desarrollo de las evaluaciones y mapas regionales de riesgos de desastres, con el fin de tomar mejores decisiones y hacer de las inversiones una, una forma resiliente para el desarrollo. Las herramientas de modelaje del riesgo como la Plataforma de Información y Coordinación para la Prevención de los Desastres y el Manejo de la Información de ese Predenac, que dicho sea de paso, es la única en Centroamérica, eh, es una plataforma virtual que permite fortalecer las capacidades de respuesta y de resiliencia de la población más vulnerable. Aquí, en, desde el Predenac, hemos desarrollado esta herramienta de manera conjunta con socios estratégicos como NASA, Google, Facebook, y nos permite modelar la información y tener eh, información en tiempo real, así como manejar información y datos históricas. 
para, como bien nos decía Brenda, poder trabajar en temas de, eh, de planificación y desarrollo eh, más oportunamente. Así es que sin más, queremos agradecer y dar paso al Learning Lab. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Marinela. Okay, so I'll go into the methodology. Um, since we have quite a few participants in, interested in the subject, we're going to work in breakout rooms. So I will pass the word to Fernando Lopez, who's our program associate for OCHA, and he'll explain a little more how these breakout rooms will work. Fernando? Thank you. Thank you very much, Brenda. Uh, can you please confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Uh, let me go into presentation mode. So basically, we're going to have uh, three groups. It's going to be group alpha, beta, and delta. Uh, you will be split into these uh, three groups. Uh, we are going to work with three experts. Um, Leonardo, Marianela, and Leonardo will, uh, for 10 minutes, 10 initial minutes, will guide the discussions, and will you with them will answer um, two questions in relation to disaster impact modeling. After these 10 minutes, um, the moderators or the experts of these groups, they will rotate to the next group, and you will then again uh, answer this um, two questions, and the same will happen for the last uh, 10 minutes. We will do this uh, group rotation and group work exercise uh, for the 30 minutes, and then we will reconvene here in the plenary where they will um, guide us and they will share with us uh, the experiences um, that they collect from each one of you in each of the uh, breakout rooms. So um, I think we can go now. Uh, please do remember that when we are in this process of breakout room, rooms, we are gonna go into hop in. So for some time, you might feel that you are getting disconnected from, from the session, but uh, please stay with us. Thank you very much and have uh, good luck on the breakout rooms. Thank you for your participation in the chat. I think there's been some really good discussions and comments coming through the chat. Um, I, so each of the facilitators uh, were taking notes based on, based on the chats and discussions. So I'm gonna pass it over to them for observations and their comments on the discussions. So let's start with um, group one, which was Leonardo. Thank you, thank you, uh, Brenda. So let me start by, you know, uh, thanking all the participants for uh, being, um, you know, very engaged and very active in the uh, in the discussion. So we were mainly looking at, you know, disaster impact modeling, and the two key questions we had was really try first of all to unpack the concept uh, of disaster impact modeling and try to give a definition. So. Uh, you know and we maybe i can mention some of the uh the topics and the elements of the uh, in the discussion so first of all when we talk about impact modeling we're mainly talking you know not only at the specific impact of an event but you know at the different impacts can that an event can have across sectors so we're talking about you know uh, impacts on the environment, uh, on the transportation, uh, the economy, the energy uh, supply, and so on. So the first, you know, thing that has been mentioned was really like around, you know, the, what is the um, the multi, you know, dimensional uh, uh, impacts that we are uh, talking about. Then um, I think we distinguish two components in um, the development of an impact model. So first of all models that look at the past to understand you know um, where risk is concentrated but also there's an element that is sort of projecting future risk and that's where i don't know models like based on climate science but also on climate change uh, science can be uh, can be used um participants mainly mentioned you know natural hazards so mainly talking about you know shocks uh, related to uh, natural hazards so drought storms wildfires cyclones uh, typhoons and uh, uh, and so on um 
Of course, one element that is very important and very crucial is also the impact on uh, on people. So more looking at the socioeconomic impact of uh, disaster. So these are the the main elements that came up during the during the discussion. And if we move to the next one, I know we are running uh, out of time. Um, so th that was actually a, a very interesting uh, uh, interesting question. So so what does it? So how a model should look like in order to be impactful, in order to be actionable, in order to be adopted um, by uh, organizations in the uh, uh, in the Latin American Caribbean region. So first of all, we, you know, I try to organize the the, the, the main uh, things that have been mentioned under three main uh, buckets. So the first one, what are the key features uh, of uh, of a model? So, you know, the model, first of all, should provide early warning systems. So here we're mainly talking about models that you know, are meant to be used when we are facing, you know, uh, uh, an, an imminent risk. So it's really about, you know, a, a drought that is likely to happen during the next season is a, you know, a, a cyclone that is, a, you know, a, about to uh, impact a certain countries. And, you know, in this uh, respect, you know, it was mentioned that especially having access uh, to information in an easy way and in real time is extremely important. So these are the two uh, main uh, things. So when we talk about impacts, so, you know, how do we um, want to use the information that is provided? So first of all, models can be used to identify high risk areas. So to sort of use models to understand where are these hotspots uh, of, uh, uh, of risk. The goal would be then to target, you know, disaster risk reduction interventions. So to start really addressing the these hotspots and to reduce, you know, uh, uh, outstanding vulnerabilities or just by reducing the exposure of people to those uh, in those locations. Um, also, like looking at something that has been mentioned already before, sort of what is, from a, a logistical perspective, the impact of disaster? So what is the impact on, uh, you know, uh, supply chain and uh, food and fuel and energy so what is really like the uh, the uh, the impact on uh, on these aspects and then you know we were actually thinking about um you know the information many times is available but why we do see you know a great increase in the in the technology and the information that is available from the modelers but less adoption i mean it's not keeping the pace with the, you know the technological and scientific development so and just to wrap up i we would like to mention three things so the first one is that it needs to be evidence-based so it needs to be backed up by uh, by science to be trusted by decision makers it needs to be co-designed uh, with end users and that's you know uh, a, a, a crucial point really for uh, making sure that people and decision makers and responders trust these models um and uh, and they feel you know uh, um, empowered by this information and the last one is really like that many times there's a you know a, a lack of communication between who's producing the forecast and who's using the forecast and this is definitely one key area for uh, you know for uh, future investments let me stop here and uh, yeah once more, thank you to all the participants, and I'm looking forward to the to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonardo. I think uh, you guys hit some really key and interesting points in your discussion. I'll turn it over now to Marilena for for the results of their discussion. Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, are we sharing the screen here, or? Um... This is my yes, correct. So uh, in this in this first question regarding the uh, the benefits of the implementation of disaster impact modeling, uh, we have um, the aids in the decision making, and also is uh, reducing the the uncertainty levels, and it's also part of the uh, uh, instrument that allows us to 
uh, develop uh, knowledge in risk informed uh, uh, so we can take decisions with a better context and, and informed decisions regarding the planning and in a prospective matter and as well in, in the response. So um, in another benefit that I have here is that it will allow uh, that through the knowledge of multiple systems to have an approximation of the possible impacts in a in a in a way that is in, in a cascaded event, uh, due to the fact that they, through the modeling you can see uh, different uh, layers of information of population, uh, rivers, infrastructure, uh, volcano of or earthquake uh, falls. So all this information can allow us to have. Uh, a better understanding in a better way to uh, uh, work the disaster risk management and, and reduce um, possible impacts, uh, not the impacts, but the, uh, the fact that it can turn into a disaster can be reduced by the, the way that we can control it through the, through the, uh, the information also like that we were talking about the historic information, but also the, the uh, information to the date. In the other part, uh, we have the key elements of the indicators that make the practicality information for decision-making. Um, and one of the key elements is that can be dulled in multiple scales and resolutions. And another element is that it reduces the uncertainty levels of, uh, of risk. And the, another element is the decisions uh, are educated in the aspect of social and economical uh, matters, and as well as the population and the uh, livelihoods. And the idea that we can space uh, risk is, is absolutely important for the elements that can be expo uh, exposed and can be also um, uh, the alert to the uh, hazards. So we will have more knowledge, as they say, and in, with this knowledge, we can take better, we can make better decisions. And the last one, is that uh, it will allow us to have more planning, inf more planned information, uh, aware and based on disaster risk reduction. And this is uh, what I have from my my board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Elena. Um, again, so we're seeing a lot of the same key issues around, you know, data and how to use that to better plan. To make better decisions in different phases. So really interesting how unpacking, but a lot of the same types of ideas. Um, so we'll go to John. And I was in John's group and we did touch a little bit on, on the questions that Marilena had, but we also had a couple more. So over to you, John. Sure. Um, thank you, Brenda. Um, yes, uh, Group Delta was full of high achievers. So uh, we answered our questions and also managed to touch on, on some of the questions Marianella mentioned as well. Um, I, I think it, it, in addition to the great information that that uh, team Bravo, uh, I think, came up with, um, we, uh, on, the, on the first question um, related to um, what are some of the benefits. So we had similar answers to the ones that Marianella's group uh, had, but uh, I think one element that we also included is that uh, response can happen very quickly. So we thought uh, disaster impact modeling can improve the the, the timeliness of, of the response as well as all those other elements. Um, and for, for the second question she had on, on the kind of key indicators, um, we, I mean, we understood the question slightly differently. So we were thinking what kind of information would be useful coming out of a disaster impact model to inform decision making. So we had things you would expect, like um, how many people potentially affected, what are the impact on some of the key sectors, 
um, what key infrastructure is at risk, what are some resources available to respond, um, and so on. So uh, just to complement what was what was uh, provided by Marianella. Um, on our questions, uh, our first question was, what are some challenges and opportunities um, in implementing disaster impact modeling? So uh, some of the opportunities are just improve our ability to respond and prepare for emergencies um, for all the reasons that were mentioned in, in some of the previous groups. Um, I, I really like this, this next uh, one about helping to do a, a cost benefit analysis. Um, to improve our decision making, right? So um, disaster impact modeling can can help us with actual emergencies, but it can also help us forecast or um, do kind of scenarios. Um, and and by doing that, it helps us to better target the kind of the, whatever funds we have to reduce the risk of of an impact of disasters. Um, so so the the key point there is that um, disaster risk reduction is an investment, not a it's not like a, an expense. Um, so, and disaster impact modeling can help inform that. Um, and also, uh, you know, it, it, with a model that's shared among all the responders, everyone can have the same uh, understanding um, uh, at, of, of a potential emergencies at the local, local, regional, and national level. So that kind of uh, common vision is, is also quite good. Um, however, it's not it's not uh, automatic or easy, right? So some of the challenges are you need a lot of baseline information um, from different uh, institutions, or government ministries, um, what have you. Um, so I mean, these models require information. How many people are there? How many houses are there? What kind of infrastructure is there? Um, what, what is the land use in, in these areas? Um, all that information needs to be, needs to come from somewhere and be gathered and used uh, by people with expertise. So that's the next point is that it's, um, yeah, I mean, some, some technical expertise is, of course is, is, is required with, uh, with GIS, um, and from, from different people. So, um, lots of opportunities and, and some, some challenges along the way. Um, our second question, uh, was what are some of the trends in the Latin American and Caribbean region? which the humanitarian community should be aware of in order to strengthen disaster preparedness in the region. Um, apologies, I know it's a bit hard to read with the, uh, the graphic in the background. I should have used the sticky notes like, like Leonardo. Um, but anyway, some of, some of the trends uh, that the humanitarian community must be aware of when working in the region uh, are, are things like climate change. Um, of course, not unique to the Latin American region, but something uh, certainly to take into consideration. Um, migration, um, forced migration in, in particular, um, is, is an important overall trend that shapes the way we respond to emergencies in the region. Um, there's a, a bunch of risk maps from something called Proyecto Mesoamerica, which I don't know much about, but it's uh, certainly having uh, maps that show high-risk areas would be useful to any um, disaster preparedness effort, of course. Um, what else do we have? Sorry, even I can barely read it. Um, sharing uh, impact data for generation of impact-based forecasts by uh, meteorological services. Um, yeah, so th this is this is what makes disaster impact modeling so interesting, right? Because it's one thing to say there is a category for hurricane coming to your town. Um, it's another thing to to have the models that say uh, two hundred thousand people um, potent live in the in the in potential impact zone of this earthquake, uh, sorry, of the hurricane. Um, five hospitals are in, in the high risk area. Uh, how many schools, how many children? Um, so, um, you know, it, it, it can make forecasts be more impact based, which then I think it becomes much easier to prepare and respond. Um, and another major trend is uh, inequality. Um, specifically inequality due to recurrent shock. So, so some countries in the, in the region um, have had combination of natural disasters, uh, maybe political crisis, uh, COVID-19 of course is, is everywhere. So there, there's a lot of inequality in the region between the different countries and different communities. And there's also a big digital divide as well in, in the region. Um, so in other words, it's not a homogeneous Latin American Caribbean region. There's, there's a lot of differences um, 
between the, the countries and, and the communities that are potentially affected. Um, yeah, so that's it for Group Delta. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, John. And it's interesting to see, I think it's um, because John has more of a response background, whereas Marilena has more of a risk reduction. They can see some of the same themes and how modeling works in so many different ways. There's so many pieces that we put together that helps you nobody know, again between cost effectiveness to better response, more efficient, how to use you know data, collect and use data between different organizations, institutions, um, getting that common common element together to be able to, pre to prepare, to respond, but also you know, to mitigate and to um, reduce the risk of disaster. So again, um, very thank you for all the participants and especially the facilitators, Fernando and, and the back team as well. Very interesting experience. Um, my first experience in a virtual lab like this. Um, I think it worked quite well. I mean, it's never the same as being in person where you can now go off for coffee and find the person who is who had the interesting ideas and continue the conversation. But maybe through the chat, maybe there's something you heard and you could uh, to follow you could follow up. But I want to thank everyone again for the for participating. I think it was a really interesting experience and some really good observations um, throughout. So. Fernando, I don't, is there any last um, housekeeping business or are we done? I think not. Thank you very much to all the experts for the time and also to the participants for, for being part of this uh, learning lab. I think that should be uh, the end of this learning lab. Thank you so much once again. Okay. Have a great afternoon. Thank you again.